want to begin looking at Luke chapter 11 and verse number 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so on earth. Give us day by day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I'm not going to take time tonight. We will, in some following weeks, go through uh, the rest of the, really the prayer that Jesus gave. But I want to just focus on verse number one and the question that the disciples asked here Lord, teach us to pray. And so tonight, This subject I I endeavor to cover is the meaning of prayer, the meaning of prayer. Shall we pray together and ask the Lord to help us? Lord, we uh, come before you now asking for your guidance and for your help in uh, this, uh, the understanding of prayer. Many of us, myself included, uh, tend to confuse it, uh, tend to get the waters all muddied up and what we think we may understand we really don't i pray that we would just come through to the simplicity of the word of god tonight and not make this all confusing and all uh, ethereal and and in the clouds help us to bring it down to the lowest shelf that every one of us can grab hold of this i pray this in jesus name amen I'm going to apologize ahead of time about this message. This message is really a very simple message. Now, I'm preaching a simple message because I'm a simple person, all right? I'm looking at a very astute crowd out here. All of you are smart, much smarter than I am. But I'm preaching this here tonight because I want it to be simple. And I, I really wrestled through this week, and I thought, Lord, I, I can't preach this simple because, truthfully, um, I, I, you know, it just I, I wrestled through it. So it is going to come come across as simple, but I want us to hopefully walk away and apply what we hear tonight. This passage of scripture, especially verse number one, I I have to say that I ver- I love this passage of scripture. Now we commonly call this. And it's parallel passage in Matthew chapter 6. We commonly call it the Lord's Prayer. But I want you to know that if we're to be technical about this, it's not really the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer, that is the prayer that He prayed for His disciples and the prayer that He prayed for us here in 2020, is actually found in John chapter 17. That's the high priestly prayer where the Lord Jesus prayed for our protection, for us to be kept sheltered from the things of this world, even though we're in this world. And that was the Lord's prayer. So you say, Pastor, well, what is Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, or Matthew chapter 6, that we commonly call the Lord's prayer? It's the disciples' prayer, if you will. It's where the Lord himself actually taught these disciples what prayer was all about. Now, it is something which the Lord taught the disciples based upon a question that they came to him. Notice here in verse number one, Lord, teach us to pray. I want you to notice something here as you read through the Gospels. You're not going to ever find the disciples asking Jesus to teach them to preach. Neither going through the Gospels are you going to see the the disciples asking Jesus to teach them to perform miracles, or even, if you will, teaching them the Word of God. Now, teaching the Word of God is important. There's no doubt that the Master, the Lord Jesus, as He went along the way, taught them the Word of God, but they don't ask any of these other things. But out of all things that they ask, what is it? Lord, teach us to pray. The question that they asked, I believe, was prompted for two reasons. One was obvious, the other unseen. First of all, notice there had been a few disciples that had been 
under the leadership of John the Baptist. And so that's why the question is asked, Lord, teach us to pray as John, and not John the disciple, but John the Baptist, just like he had taught us to pray, we need you to teach us to pray. So it's obvious why they ask. They kind of bring in a, a correlation here. You know, they had watched the Lord Jesus Christ in his prayer life. They had heard him pray with them. They had witnessed him often spend sleepless nights in communion with his father, Mark chapter 1, verse 35, and in the morning, the Bible says, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Luke chapter 6, verse 12, it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and notices and continued all night in prayer to God. Matthew chapter 14, verse 23, and when he had sent the multitudes away, he went apart into a mountain to pray, and when the evening was come, he was there alone. So the obvious reason is, John had taught them to pray, but they started seeing the prayer life of Jesus, and they said, Lord, we want you to teach us to pray, but I think there's even something more important to be seen, and the correlation is this. It is the ministry and life of Jesus, and it is his prayer life. In essence, they saw something in his public life, and they put a correlation that it had to do with something of his private prayer life. In essence, what did the disciples see? Well, I'll tell you what, you back up in Luke, and you start looking at the great things that Jesus had accomplished we're talking about victory after victory after victory. We're talking about demon-possessed people that have been healed. We're talking about blind people that have been healed. We're talking about great teaching of the Word of God. And in the public life of Jesus, there is the power of God that is all over Him. And the disciples are starting to put two and two together. They're saying to themselves, here is this man who is the Son of God, who is performing all of these miracles, teaching the Word of God, doing such great things. In essence, they're saying there's power in his life. How is that power there? Guess what? They noted he prayed at night. He got alone with God. He communed with the Father because in order for him to be able to do the work of God, he had to get alone with the Father. And boy, I hope you and I can grab a hold of that, that in order for us to be able to minister in whatever capacity we're in, whatever function we have in this local church in order for us to be spiritually effective to be able to do our work for God my friend we must pray and the disciples seeing that public power of God noting it was from the prayer time in his closet they said this question Lord teach us to pray we want to be effective for God. We want to be used for God. So therefore, would you take time to teach us to pray? What a powerful question it is. Now, you and I tonight, it may not be that we ask that question, but I don't think there's anything wrong with that question. But I think our question really is more in the realm of a statement. Lord, I don't know how to pray. How do I get alone with you? How do I spend time with you? What is it about this prayer that I'm supposed to have? Lord willing, in this series, we'll begin to answer some of those questions and help one another out. I think our prayer life sometimes, many times, and I'm describing my prayer life as sometimes it's a frustration. It's a lack of how to. It's a falling on my face and failure. It's a spiritual defeat for me many times. And so therefore, I come before the Lord and say, Lord, teach me to pray. Don't you think God wants us to learn this very basic spiritual discipline of life? I think so. I think in the context of prayer in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells us a couple of pertinent things. I'm not going to take time to turn back there, but Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, here's the way Jesus taught in that message, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 9 through 11, he says, well, What man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? 
Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? That is, no father in their right mind, if their child comes and asks them for something, they're not going to give them something else that's going to hurt them. What's the passage saying? Even our heavenly father here is going to do great things for those who ask him and come before him in prayer. So in studying the Gospels and in looking through the prayer life of Jesus, I want us to gather some things here tonight and the weeks to come and to be able to answer this overriding question by tackling the meaning of prayer tonight. In other words, what is prayer? And I'm going to give you four words, simple words, four words that convey the essence of prayer. Number one, I want you to notice this, prayer is spiritual. It is spiritual. Now you say, preacher, that's obvious. I told you this message was going to be simple. It's spiritual. Now when we say that prayer is spiritual, we are indicating that it is the opposite of the flesh. That is, in other words, prayer is not of a fleshly nature. It's not of the natural man, if you will. So let's take those two words tonight for just a few moments and let us understand what prayer is not. Number one, the prayer life of a believer is not fleshly. You know, many times people look at prayer as a discipline that they can master, like other disciplines of the physical life. I grew up up playing a lot of sports, but one of the favorite sports that I had played was basketball. And from the time that I was young, I I didn't play a lot in leagues until I got into high school. But I'll tell you what, we had a a basket outside that my dad had set up, and we didn't have a, 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 a... a court, a hard court that we could use. It was just a dirt court. But I'll tell you what, I sat out there till it got dark and I made shots and I learned how to dribble and I had people teach me how to do things. And I learned all the basics of basketball. And therefore I came into high school and I was able to begin playing on an organized team. What is it? There's learning the basics, the discipline of it in order to master it. I'll tell you something I didn't master was playing the piano. My dad, for one year, took me for piano lessons. Now, I'll tell you what, if you want to humble a seventh grader boy, go ahead and take him for piano lessons. I'll tell you, it was the last thing. People were like, hey, you want to go out? And I'm like, no, 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 I can't, I can't. And they said, well, well, come on, why can't you go? I'm going to play the piano, you know. I just, uh, it just was a little hard as a seventh grade boy. But I'll tell you what. I may growing up have been a plumber, I may have been a master electrician, but I'll tell you, after a year of taking piano, never would I ever become a piano player, I'm just telling you. I don't know, my fingers just don't work that way, never was able to do typing, and so piano just wasn't there. I didn't learn the basics, couldn't get it down. But we have a lot of things in this life that we learn, don't we? We, we, we gather things together and we learn the disciplines and we can master those things. You know what many times we look at, the, at prayer is all about? We think to ourselves, all right, now look, I, I heard uh, Brother Richard George pray this way. And uh, I, I watched the pastor and he kind of he stood this way while he prayed. And, you know, and we almost think that there's all these little rituals that we do, and we think, well, if I, can get, if I can say it this way and use these words and stand this way and do all these things, then I've got prayer down. My friend, I want to tell you something. Prayer is of a spiritual nature. It is not something you sit there and you master and you go, all right, I got all that squared away. What's the next thing in the Christian life? It's not the way it works. It is of a spiritual nature. But secondly, I want you to notice here uh, uh, the fact that it's, 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 it's not fleshly here. Uh, I want you to notice the prayer life of a believer is not natural. What do I mean by that? You ever been like me that you haven't felt like praying sometimes? Now, come on. I know you're in church. You can't lie in church, all right? But truthfully... How many of you have been like me? You don't need to raise your hand. But you've been like me where you say, "Mm, I know I need to pray, but I I just don't feel like it. 
Or we say, I don't have time to pray. I'm too busy. I'll catch up with that later. Oh, if you're like me, later never comes around. So prayer really is not fleshly. It's not natural. We treat prayer many times on the basis of how we feel. But let me say this, if it is of a spiritual nature, and if I'm describing what it is not, that is, it's not fleshly, it's not natural, but it's of a spiritual nature, can I tell you that it is that part of my life that is generated by the Spirit of God who dwells inside of me? You know what the problem with too many Christians is? Why they don't feel like praying? Why they don't take the time to pray? Is because they're so dominated by the world. I'm going to just tell you a prayer killer for you is the television. Let me say that again in case you didn't hear it. Turn your hearing aids up, please. A prayer killer is the television. A prayer killer is all the entertainment. And we may not be out at the bars and we may not be out in all the uh, worldly activities, but we have consumed our lives with all the entertainment and no wonder why we don't pray. No wonder why there isn't power in the house of God. But I'm here to remind you that prayer is a spiritual matter and we get so dominated by the world that the Spirit of God saying, I'm here. I think a look at Romans chapter 8, I wish I had time to look at that tonight, but it reminds us very well about that fleshly part of us, that carnality of this world, the carnal side of us. What does it say? It's death. It's death. may not be that we die and go to hell, but it is a separation from everything good that God has for us. What about this spiritual life? It's life and peace is what it is. It's beautiful. Oh, take Romans chapter 8 and look through it. So, number one, if I'm going to describe prayer and help give a meaning to it, number one, it's spiritual. But number two, I want you to notice this, it is communicable. Now, when I'm speaking about communicable, I'm not talking about that which is transferable like a communicable disease, okay? I'm talking about the area of communication. Communication. What is prayer? If I were to give a definition of prayer and I were just to say, here's what prayer is. If I had a new believer come to me and he said, "Uh, Pastor, tell me what prayer is. You know what I tell him? Prayer is talking to God. Now, I'm not doing any injustice to the Scripture. It really is talking to God. Now, there's a lot of different ways. We give thanksgiving. We have supplication. We have all these different things. And we can put a lot of things. But very simply, if we were bring it down to a nutshell, prayer is talking to God. Now, you look at the Sermon on the Mount, and there's a lot to be said about talking to the Lord. I'll tell you, look at Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 8, and he talks about the Pharisees, and he tells us, don't be like these people. What are the Pharisees like? Well, they go around and and, uh, they pray to be heard for their much speaking, the Bible says. You know, they want people to know how big of words they use. And they want people to know how long they pray. And they want people to know how good of a prayer they are. And Jesus says, that's not what prayer is. Prayer is not all about an eloquent speech. Prayer is not a mantra. Prayer is not repeating words from memory. Prayer is about communication with the Father in heaven. That's what it's all about. And I love in the the way Jesus uses this in Luke chapter 11, verse number 2, when ye pray, say, what's the next two words? Our Father our father now a question for you how do you speak with your earthly father now i understand there's a reverence and a respect but my kids and your kids i'm sure never came to you and said uh, well uh, father oh, we want to you know sometimes we have people that pray like in this ethereal language and and uh, you know they, they 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 feel like prayer has to sound a certain way I'll tell you, my kids have just barged in once in a while and said, hey, Dad, can you know, they're just, they're just coming into my presence and they want to ask something. They need some help. They need some guidance on something. 
And I want to remind you that prayer is just very simply you talking to the Father above your Heavenly Father. What a powerful thing. I believe we complicate and confuse what prayer really is. If you and I could simply get a view of communicating with someone we love, develop spending time with them, it'll help you and I greatly. I remember when my, first, my wife and I first met. I met my wife through my brother-in-law, my, my brother-in-law now here, and, and uh, he, he actually was the matchmaker for our getting together. And I'll never forget thinking about that first dinner we were going to have together. While I was at Bob Jones University, I, uh, it was arranged. I had asked Darla if she would meet me for dinner. And uh, at that time at the university, in front of the dining common, I believe there were three water fountains. So if you ever were meeting somebody for dinner, you'd always tell them, it was just common. I'll meet you at the first uh, water fountain, or the second one, the middle one, or, or the far one. And so I told her, I said, I'll meet you at the first one. I'll never forget waiting. She was getting her hair done. Now, how many of you remember in the 80s, I'll tell you, the big hair, you know? You ought to come over to my house and see the, the hair that my wife had. And then some of the old pictures, you know, it's like, whoosh. Can anybody take me home tonight? <laughs> I think I'm in trouble. It wasn't part of the notes. You can look, I promise. I promise. But she had a friend of hers was uh, getting her ready, and so I, I, I was waiting patiently. But I'm thinking to myself, now what am I going to talk about? All right, I'm, I'm going to ask her about this. I'll ask her about that. We'll talk about this. And so then we sat down. And you know, when you first are starting to get with somebody that you like, I mean, the conversation's a little awkward sometimes. And you start, you know, start thinking of things that you can talk about trying to get to know. But you know, after now, almost 30 years of being married, it is a natural thing to communicate. Why? We love one another. We've spent a lot of time together. We have worked through all the uh, intricacies of the, of the beginning times, and now we're here, and we can just enter into the conversation at any moment, and we enjoy that time. That's the way it's to be with God. Far too many people come before God in their prayer time, and they pray as if they have not prayed for years. My friend, your prayer ought to be with God as common as it is with your spouse or your family member or someone close to you. It is simple communication with God. And I believe that in order to enhance your communication with God, I want to recommend the following to you. Number one, set out a time to speak with Him. Set out a time to speak with Him. Busy people must make time to spend together. They need to. Search His Word. You say, how, how do I get alone with God? How do I pray? Search His Word. Can I tell you, as you get into the Word of God, it's going to give fuel for the fire? Stay right with God. This will keep you from feeling distant. And then when you pray, sit still and listen. It will guide you in how and what to pray. So number one, it is, uh, uh, it is communicable. Uh, number two, it is spiritual. But number three, I want you to notice this, it is invitational. Invitational. I want you to think about the fact that God is the one who has initiated, created, and yes, has defined what prayer is all about. And that God is inviting you to come into His presence to speak with Him. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Come unto me, all ye that labored are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Jeremiah 33, 3, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great mighty things which thou knowest not. James 4, verse 8, Draw nigh to God, and He'll draw nigh to you. Psalm 27, verse 7 and 8, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. 
And then I love this part. When thou saidest, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. The implication is God is saying, look, come, seek me. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 22. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith over and over and over again. You know what there is? There's an invite by the God. You and I are receiving in the mail day after day an invitation from God to come into his presence every day. There is an invitation by way of, 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 of uh, that God is giving to you to say, come into my presence and be with me. Why does God invite us to pray? Well, he desires to help you. God desires to help you. The way you get your help is to come and ask before God. I love 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him. I believe that's through prayer here, casting that care. Why? He cares for you. Philippians 4, 6, we looked at this a couple weeks ago. Be careful for nothing. That is, don't worry about anything, but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. God invites you to pray. But lastly, I want you to see this. It is relational. It is relational. You know, I think we have a lot of funny notions about what prayer is. Can I tell you tonight, prayer is not like a lottery. You know, there's a lot of people that uh, might go ahead and play the lottery. People kind of gamble some different things. And some people kind of treat prayer in this fashion. They think, all right, look, I'll, I'll come and I'll say this little prayer, and hopefully if I can kind of get it, and they'll refer to God as the man upstairs, hopefully he'll just kind of throw down some little blessing. My friend, you don't have it. That's what you think prayer is all about. Sometimes people look at prayer as this twisting of God's arm, and somehow we, we, we've got to uh, uh, get God to do something that uh, we want Him to do. My friend, God, prayer is not getting God what we want Him to do. Prayer is coming before God and having God turn things around and us doing what God wants us to do. That's what prayer is all about. Sometimes we think prayer is also like a kind of this little... Uh, meaningful ritual and this religious act that has no social consequences. I'm here to remind you of something that as you get alone with God and as you pray to Him, God's going to be working on your heart to be doing things that you ought to be doing. Oh, the Bible talks about in James chapter 2, verses 14 to uh, 17 or 16, I think it is, it gives us a, a scenario about uh, praying before the Lord. And this aspect here of when you come before the Lord, that is, God begins to work on your heart to give help to certain people. I'll tell you, this relational aspect of prayer is very important. I've addressed it a little bit tonight, but it's this simple fact. We address the Father as He is, the Father of His children, you and I. You and I are His children. You and I who are blood-bought, I've been doing some little recordings here for questions that have been asked for our Calvary Connection broadcast, and I, I did one this afternoon, and somebody had asked the question, do we pray to the Lord Jesus Christ, or do we pray to God the Father, or is there a difference? And really, any person of the Trinity you can pray to, you can pray to God the Father, you can pray to the Son, you can pray to the Holy Spirit, but there is something to be said about prayer. That is, we pray to God the Father, He's the one that provides all our needs. We pray in the name of Jesus, and we pray enabled by the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's to God the Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. But when I say the name of Jesus, how is that? It is because the blood of Jesus Christ has made a way possible for me to come before God. My friend, don't ever forget the fact that you're coming to God not because you have the right to, not because you're anybody special, but every one of us are on the same plane, and that is we are coming on the merits of Jesus Christ. In his name. And I encourage you when you close your prayers out.
to pray in Jesus' name as a reminder to you and to those that may, you may be praying with that it is by Jesus Christ and His death, burial, and resurrection that I have the ability to come to Him.